Thank you very much, Peter and Lou, for joining us um, to mark the occasion of the International Forest Day. Um, I just wanted to highlight that 2015 is a very exciting year for both development and climate change. Um, we're going to be, the global community rather, is going to be deciding on the new climate agreement framework and we're also going to be deciding on the post-2015 development agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals. So how would you describe the role of forests in these agendas? Forestry is obviously really, really important for the development agenda. And I think we have an opportunity this year to say that it is not only about the environment. Forestry can contribute to eliminate poverty, to food security, to prosperity in the green economy, to energy and to water and so on. So I think we really have an opportunity to show that forestry can contribute very broadly to the development challenges. How about yourself, Lou? I, I agree with Peter. You know, forestry is, is an economic activity, first and foremost. And, um, and it has, it, it does contribute significantly to rural livelihoods now. It contributes to sustainable development. Um, and uh, as we've seen in the climate change agenda, the, the forestry is one of the areas where we're at, the world is actually making progress. You know, Brazil is, has significantly reduced its deforestation rates. And, and as a result of that, Brazil is the country that has done the most to, to uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, while other countries have continued to increase their emissions. So I think that uh, it, it's, it's important for, for the environmental services that Peter was talking about, um, for, for water, for energy. Um, and I think it's going to be, continue to grow in importance. We're, we're seeing, uh, I guess we have, what, 1.7 billion people across the planet have no access to, to uh, electricity. Uh, 2.7 billion are, are, are using wood fuels and, and, and dung in unclean situations. They're, so they're, 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 the way they, they, they prepare their food, the, 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 the burning of, of these fuels is leading to, to respiratory illnesses. You know, having forestry come in and, and, and support the shift to more sustainable energy sources for uh, rural development, for rural people, is going to have an impact on women's health, it's going to have an impact on, on children's health, it's going to have an impact on, on uh, uh, the ability to, to do things in these landscapes to support development. How about, how about the RED program? Um, you know, RED program was proposed as the major platform for addressing climate change mitigation in 2005. And 10 years on, the implementation hasn't really begun. How would you assess the progress that's been made on, on RED? The progress on RED, I, I, I th it started off, I think, very idealistic um, and, and very unrealistic. I think, uh, you know, there, there were expectations that it would be a low cost, uh, easy win for, for the climate system. Um, and those of us who have been working in tropical forestry for, for, for decades, you know, really didn't, you know, didn't buy that, that argument, you know. And, and so as, as the, the international community has, has gotten more into to development of RED and, and, and defining just what is RED and ha what are the modalities for it to, to be operational, um, they've come to terms more with the reality that, that, that tropical foresters have known about in, in uh, these landscapes for a long time. That, that there are people who live in the forest, that are people who depend upon these forests, that, that their concerns need to be addressed, that, that uh, um, it, it, these, these rural landscapes are not places that we just set aside like a museum. We actually need to, to find ways to use them sustainably. And, and so we need to put in place the models that allow us to do that. So I think the, the, the real progress ha has perhaps been at the international to national communities coming to terms with the realities on the ground of, of what needs to happen in order to make RED uh, truly functional. Um, and so we see a, a shift. There's, there's still this idea that, that, um, that RED is still an objective. It's a goal. We want to achieve emissions reductions by reducing deforestation. But now I think we have a much more nuanced understanding of just how an international mechanism might actually support that, how international financial resources might be mobilized, how technical support uh, might be mobilized to actually achieve that on the ground. So I see, us, I see the world now as, as poised to, to begin implementation. As, as I mentioned previously, Brazil has had some successes in reducing its deforestation. There are certain lessons to be learned there, although the lessons of Brazil may not apply everywhere in the world. Um, I think we're, we're beginning to get more and more experience in Africa. We're seeing experiences here in, in Southeast Asia um, uh, coming along. And, and, and we do have demonstration projects at province level, at, at, at uh, community level, that are moving forward. Sometimes in fits and starts, some things are not working as well as expected initially, but these are all important lessons to be learned. So I think if, if the international community can distill the lessons from these early experiences, um, we can actually see a way forward as to, to how this is going to play out over the course of the next 15 or 20 years. And this really has to be a long-term effort, you know, reducing the deforestation and managing tropical landscapes 
more effectively isn't something that's going to be solved with, with uh, you know, a little bit of money over the next five years. It's going, to be a, it's going to be a long haul. So the fact that we're 10 years into it and we're now coming to face to face with reality, I think we're, we're now set to, to, to see it take off and be more constructive than it, it could have been. I'd like to add to that and say that we, we are gradually, we're increasingly coming to this conclusion that, that the red objective is great. It adds value to forest and forestry in the tropics, um, but it also needs to coexist with a lot of other values and a lot of other benefits from, from those same forests. And, and therefore, we need to always think about multiple objectives, multiple purposes of, of, uh, of the forest and the landscapes. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that's where RED is maturing into uh, and, and we are looking at, the, first of all, landscapes as a whole, but also looking at them as delivering multiple objectives. And I can also, I would also like to, to take that to another um, level and look at the climate change process as a whole and, and the development, sustainable development goals and the post-2015 process as a whole. These have been two tracks that have existed in parallel for quite a long time in the, on the international arena. And surprisingly, um, little um, crossovers have happened over the past decade or so. In fact, the, there are reports that say that sustainable, sustainable development is a co-benefit to achieving the climate objectives. And that's a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. But what we can see this year in 2015 is that there is a real opportunity for, for um, combining or, or to see a confluence between these two major international development and, and uh, climate uh, negotiations. So in 2015, hopefully we can see a real uh, combination of the development goals and the climate goals. Um, but to what extent is that actually happening? Because to me, it seems like there are these two parallel processes that are interrelated, but then they're also quite separate. Well, there is the institutional aspect that they have been carried out by themselves for, for a great deal of years. But at the political level, I think we can see a lot of, of uh, uh, efforts at the moment. We had a climate summit last September in New York, uh, which was at the same time as the UN General Assembly, which is also negotiating over the sustainable development mm -hmm. goals. So we see a, a great um, deal of political effort to bring these together. Mm -hmm. uh, you also hear in, in climate meetings that now is really the time to put the climate objectives in the context of, of sustainable development. So I think it's happening, but it's, um, it, it's a process. No, exactly. And, and we'll be seeing how this unfolds as, as national um, uh, priorities are de defined, as national action plans are put in place. So uh, there's going to be, there are action plans already in, in related to climate change and there will be more planning uh, associated with that. I think we'll see a planning process and, and, and uh, benchmarking processes associated with the, the SDGs. Um, so as, as we see how countries begin to, to set their benchmarks and, and, and set their objectives, and define their indicators, I think we'll, we'll be able to, to see these things come together a little more closely. They'll begin to realize synergies. And you know, more and more we're hearing the, these discussions go beyond ministries of forestry and ministries of environment. You know, agriculture is, is talking about what can be done within the agricultural sector to reduce emissions and improve their sustainability. Um, I think the, 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 some of these pledges that we've seen from, from the private sector, so the, from agribusiness, has been extremely um, useful in, in, in moving the, the, that sector along that direction. You know, more and more in developing countries, the, the, what's driving uh, some of these emission uh, generating activities in these landscapes is not so much about population, but it, it's about income and, and how income is changing consumption patterns. And this is mediated a lot by the, these larger uh, agribusiness uh, companies. If they're becoming more aware and, and, and beginning to make these zero deforestation pledges or these pledges to reduce emissions or reduce their, their climate footprint to, to, to committing to, to social responsibly, re socially responsible actions in the landscapes where they derive their, their primary materials, um, I think we're, we're seeing things moving in, in a direction where we're actually go going to see these two agendas come closer together and, and we'll see more synergies. Mm -hmm. I see, I see a li the zero deforestation um, efforts and, and ambitions are, are really a positive force at the moment. Um, but one can't also start asking some questions about that. Mm -hmm. For example, what does it actually mean? Yep. Um, Zero deforestation is, sounds good and it's uh, easy to put on, on, on a uh, policy uh, for, for the private corporations. 
but getting down to the nitty-gritty and, and figuring out what does it actually mean and, and how do we verify that, that the deforestation is actually zero. Um, it's not so easy. And, and uh, there's also perhaps a discussion to take that yes, zero deforestation would be good, but there might also be other measures that are necessary to, to make sure that uh, we maintain the, the, uh, the, the vitality and, and diversity of forests and at, at the same time the productivity of, of the agriculture landscape. So there are, there are different aspects to the zero deforestation challenge. Yeah. Um, to me, another issue that I'm quite concerned about is that the the, the concern seems to be about net zero deforestation as opposed to absolute. Of course, we can't achieve absolutes, but then uh, what are some of the trade-offs that we need to consider? Um, and, and does that actually mean that you know, there will be certain practices which will go on as usual, being compensated by others that, that are perhaps different, but still um, the situation isn't, isn't particularly amenable to? First, there is no such thing as net deforestation. Deforestation is the loss of forests. If you want to, to, to calculate the, the net of deforestation and afforestation, then that becomes the net forest area change. The, the concept of net deforestation doesn't really exist. But it is true, that is one, one of the definitional aspects that, that is unclear in the current debate. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree, and, <coughs> and I think we, we still don't have models. You know, we, we have commitments, and these commitments are relatively new. What's going to be interesting to see is, is what do the corporations do to put these in place? Um, and and the, the issues are, well, they're, they're very real for, for rural communities. You know, if you're going to have a completely traceable supply chain, you know, what's going to happen to the smallholder producer? You know, they're much more difficult to monitor than, than large-scale plantations, for example. And there are already concerns that, that some of these corporate commitments are going to be pushing the, these uh, the small-scale producers, the, 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 the less wealthy, the, 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 the less well-endowed with land um, players out of the market. And, and uh, uh, so, so there are some downsides to it that we need to pay attention to. That, uh, you know, if these things are supposed to improve environmental performance, but they don't also improve social performance, then, then we're, uh, we're not going in the right direction. We're, we're moving away from the objectives of the sustainable development goals, which really is about achieving both simultaneously. Yeah, that comes back to the discussion before about, it's not only about achieving the, the climate change mitigation goal, it has to be done together with achieving all those other objectives that are expressed by the sustainable development and sustainable development goals. So, so uh, that, that really, um, I think, will be one of the biggest discussion items this year. And if you look at the smallholder producers that Lou mentions, of course they are from the outset in a very disadvantaged situation and they often depend on, on the corporations for selling their, their produce and, and there might be other arrangements in place too. So, so the, whole, the whole issue of rights for, for smallholders will be another big item, I think, in, in the debate over how to achieve the sustainable development goals. Um, one area that we've started to work on here in this context is, is finance, because the access to affordable and fair finance for smallholder producers is something that might help us a long way towards achieving some of the sustainability outcomes that we're after. But how do we, how do we incentivize the corporate structures or corpor corporations to actually address these social issues? What is the role of governments and civil society organizations in the process? Well, when it comes to zero deforestation, it, it's more a market, uh, market uh, solution. Uh, and uh, the question then becomes, what is the role, role of the consumers? Yeah, I think a lot of the advances we've seen have really been through sort of the <clears throat> The stick approach, right? The the the, the international NGOs have been holding uh, uh, corporations up for public scrutiny, uh, exposing uh, um, unsustainable practices or unfair practices or, or, or environmentally damaging practices. This has done a lot to, to move these corporations along because they care about their image, they care about what the consumer thinks of them, and, and the, if the consumers are informed and want to improve the performance of their consumption then they're going to demand products that, that are, are more environmentally sustainable, that are, that are produced in, in socially responsible ways. Um, but it, again, it, it, it's, 
we're just get, we're just getting started on this. It, this isn't something that's pervasive or, or that's happening across uh, all markets uh, in the world. And you know, we have a lot of markets in emerging economies right now that are not necessarily demanding the, these environmentally sustainably produced products. Um, and so there's a need to, to educate those consumers. There's a need for for, um, for for these markets to actually care about what they're buying and the quality of what they're buying and, and what's the impact of, of the production systems that lead to their products. So it, we're seeing, I guess, largely driven at the moment by, by Western consumption and Western consumption preferences. But the sustainability is really going to be in the, the ability to globalize that movement and, and have other markets that, that, uh, that are going to be the, the source of increasing demand require the same things from the, the companies. It seems that this, the civil society has become quite engaged together with the corporate sector, particularly on this uh, zero deforestation um, ID. And uh, one thought that I've had is that it's, that's really good, it's a positive collaboration. But if now both the civil society and the private corporation are sitting together uh, around this objective, um, who will do the monitoring and verification of, of, uh, of uh, this uh, commitment that, that we're talking about? And um, I've seen in the last uh, few weeks only, I've seen some new uh, news items coming up that uh, Actually, there is still deforestation going on, but who is then really, who should we, who should we look to to figure out what's, what's actually happening on the ground if all the stakeholders are sitting together? Yeah, that, that, that's a very real, very important question. You know, who gets to decide what the numbers are? Everybody has an interest, and, and now if the interests are, are aligned, there's, there's no oppositional interest, then who's going to actually be the skeptic in the room that, that's going to hold the numbers up to scrutiny? And another question I had was that um, why are everybody so happy with zero deforestation all of a sudden? Because if, if I was concerned about the forests, then, then perhaps I would like to see negative deforestation uh, to, to uh, get some of those forests back into, into uh, um, a better condition. And, uh, but it seems that uh, zero deforestation from now on is, is what everybody's looking to. Um, you've talked about the role of civil society organizations and also corporations, but what about the role of governments? What, is, what can governments do to ensure that you know, there is monitoring and there is verification, there are safeguards, and there are proper regulations, both the carrots and the sticks? I, I think governments are, are where the action, where the ball got rolling. Um, so I think they, they've played that role. But clearly they need to, uh, you know, as as they, they represent the people of the country, they, they're the ones that need to safeguard the well-being or, or the, or of, of the people that make sure that, that, that um, all factions within society ha have a voice at the table and are represented at the table that are, are, and are taken seriously, that the concerns are being addressed, that it's not uh, an uneven playing field for, for everyone, so that the trade-offs can be managed, recognized, and, 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 and dealt with. Um, so that's certainly a role for governance, but, but we all know that, that in, in many places, there are problems associated with governance, and, and there's not always good governance. There, there are countries that are in conflict. There are countries that, that uh, you know, have, have uh, uh, a long history of, of, of governments not representing the, the, the all, all, all members of society or all factions within society. Um, and uh, these things, it, it's an imperfect world that we're, we're stepping into to, to, to begin to implement these things. We need to, to recognize these things, and this is hopefully what the international community can also play a role in, in, in providing some of the backstopping and, and, and the, 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 the fact-checking on some of these, these issues when, when claims are made by countries. You know, well, these claims need to be actually scrutinized and verified, and, and, and that's the whole point of, you know, we, we have within the, the, the red mechanism a whole discussion on, on measurement reporting and verification, and, and this, this verification side of things has been the real difficult issue to, to deal with in the negotiations because that it means that countries actually have to give up a, a certain level of sovereignty and, and submit, submit their, their claims or their statements to, to international scrutiny. And then if, it do, if what they claim doesn't hold up to that scrutiny, palliative measures need to be taken to, to, to do that. So, so it, it's probably the, the more difficult thing to negotiate in, in this is, is the verification. But if you, ha you can have trust, but if you don't verify, it's hard to maintain trust over the long term. We've, we've learned that through you know, um, all sorts of international negotiations around, around economics, arms reductions, all that sort of stuff. So. I think one, one area where governments are, are uh, 
could be really helpful is that they could lift the, the issues and uh, not look at one objective at a time. Um, as we discussed several times in this, in this conversation, um, if you only look at the climate objective, then maybe other objectives will suffer. Um, in the same vein, if you only look at, at the, the issues of forest and forestry, uh, then what happens with food security and, and with, the, with other aspects of, of development, and particularly the, the, uh, the land-based sectors, what the, if you take agriculture and forest and perhaps also mining, um, how do they interact and how, how, can, how can we find combined solutions? Because as it is today, you can, you can one day have as a, as a major news item that uh, deforestation continues and we have to meet our red obligations. Um, and, and the government must help to, to make that happen. And the next day you can see a, a, a news item that the price of rice is going up and, and uh, now the government has to step in to make sure that we produce enough rice in, in, uh, to, to, to feed the population. So you, you always have these um, contradictory um, uh, objectives being, being tabled and governments, I think, should step up and, and uh, look at it more comprehensively. Mm -hmm. um. Uh, I was, uh, Lou, just following up on, on a point that you'd raised earlier about um, social issues related to Red Plus. Mm -hmm. um, a major study by C4, which is going to be released soon, is showing that women are participating less in Red Plus processes. They know very little about Red Plus as well. And I think that that's going to undermine, seriously undermine, both the efficacy and legitimacy of Red Plus. Mm -hmm. um, what can be done to safeguard um, these issues and ensure that Red Plus is more inclusive? Uh, that, that's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> you know, there, there, are, there is an international commitment to a certain number of safeguards within, uh, within the, the, the implementation of the Red Mechanism. And amongst that is free prior informed consent of people who are currently using forest resources. And, and we know that, that uh, you know, Women make up more than 50% of rural populations because of, of, of rural to urban migration. You know, women tend to be more present in, in the, the villages and then making the decisions about how land is managed in these villages. So it's extremely important to bring them into to the discussion and, and, and have their, their concerns recognized. Civil society has a huge role to play in this right now and, and is trying to play that role. Um, but I think there's also a, the onus is on, a bit on the governments to make some extra steps as they put in place their red mechanisms to make sure that their internal uh, national consultative processes are, are taking women's issues into account, that, that women are at the table and, and they're well represented, that their views are represented. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that the international community is committed to, but, but again, it, we're, it, we're early days in, in the implementation and, and things are not perfect and, and clearly this is one area where, where rapid progress it would, should, should be made um, and, and this should be made a, a matter of priority for national processes and, and the international community needs to step up and, and make sure that uh, when countries report on what they're doing with respect to uh, the, these safeguards and, and the implementation of these safeguards, that these questions are asked, particularly about gender and, and, and uh, disadvantaged communities, marginalized communities within society. But um, how, just a follow-up question, how, how, does that, how does that happen at an international level? Especially when marginalization, um, you know, vulnerable communities, they differ from one society to another. So at the international level, how can monitoring take place? Countries have to report on what they're doing to achieve implementation of the safeguards. And so what needs to be put in place are standards of reporting, but also standards of, of performance. And this is where, where things have broken down a little bit. You know, the, 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 the national sovereignty issue has come into place and, and these, it stopped the international community from putting forward standards, and, and, but, but uh, standards of performance. It, it's really sort of stopped, it's, it's stuck right now at standards of reporting. I think as reports come in and, and, and as these issues come more to the fore, civil society, of course, is going to be, be keeping an eye on this and, and making us more aware of this. Scientists and researchers need to, to be looking at this as well and reporting on, on just what is happening. As more knowledge about this comes about, I think we're going to see the, the international community move a little further down the road to, to specifying standards of, of, of performance in addition to standards of reporting. Um, and, and once those standards of performance are in place, then countries will have better guidance on what to do to, to implement it. But ultimately, the responsibility is going to come back to the national government 
and, and we get back to the, the, the issues I, I raised before as to, you know, better or, or not better, not so good performance of, of individual governments. Do, do you think that the, the, uh, the drive for standardized measures and reporting is, uh, is, uh, poses some risks for the diversity of uh, situations in the reality that we have? If they get over-prescriptive, I would agree. If, if it's more about um, a, achievement of performance to, to certain levels, um, I, I think we, the standards can actually help countries. And I think this is where, you know, there's a big debate that, that uh, in, in Lima um, about whether, we, whether countries need additional guidance for, um, for the, the safeguards. Several countries were really in favor because they were completely lost. Like, where do we start on, on, on this? How can we tell if, we have, uh, if we're achieving any performance, if we're improving or, or not? What, what are our benchmarks? What are our baselines? What, what, what do we measure progress? How do we measure our progress? Other countries felt that it was more of an, an international um, overreach and, and, and uh, impinging on their own ability to make uh, uh, decisions. And if you looked at the, co the countries, it seemed to be, you know, the, the emerging economies were comfortable being able to, to, to work with what they already had in interna international guidance and achieve the outcomes. It was the least developed countries that, were, that felt that they were lost and, and, and needed additional guidance. Um, so I, I think it's, it's I, I still think that at some point Additional guidance with respect to how do you define, you know, if you've achieved free prior and informed consent, you know, is, you know, how much dissent is, is, is allowable? You know, if one person dissents, does it stop the whole thing? If, if 10 people dissent, does it stop the whole thing? If 100 people dissent, does it stop, you know, what, what constitutes, you know, proper dissent and, and, and what, at what level does dissent stop actions and, and activities? Um, and I think these are some of the things that the countries are wrestling with right now. And also who decides what, exactly. the, what the criteria should be? That, that's, uh, an important yeah. factor too. Um, and that brings me to, to my last question, which is what is the role of C4 in both highlighting the importance of forests and in safeguarding the rights and livelihoods of people who live in the forests? What do you see? And where, could, uh, where, where is C4 headed? Guarding the, the values of the natural resource as well as, as uh, making sure that uh, the, the livelihoods of uh, people are uh, uh, looked after, taken care of, and, and uh, opportunities are, are there. And, and then ultimately to, to uh, serve all that, that the governance of, of uh, forest natural resources and also uh, law and order at large is, is serving these purposes. I think we, we have a very broad playing field as, as C4 and we work with forestry in the broadest possible manner to, to cover this full range of, of, of uh, subjects that I, that I mentioned. And uh, what we do is, is research of course, but we also have a role in, in uh, building capacities to understand and deal with these issues in, in the countries where we operate. And also we, we have uh, taken on and will continue to take on a role to to reach out and, and to nurture a dialogue on these issues, both at the international level and, and the national level. So it's really exciting because forestry, I think, will be one of the cornerstones in the new development, development and climate frameworks that we will see materializing in 2015. And, and forestry is really relevant across the board in, in that framework. One interesting comparison is with the Millennium Development Goals that we had uh, starting in year 2000. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were kind of designed in the same way as the SDGs, or at least with the same purpose, although they were only to be valid for, for the so-called developing countries, um, whereas the SDGs are supposed to be global. Um, but one, as I see it, major flaw with the MDGs was that forests were only visible under the environment goal, and the only indicator that, that, that brought up forests explicitly was, was the, the one that talked about area change, that is deforestation plus the gain of forests. That was the only measure by which the state of forest and the developments and the success of, of forestry was communicated under the MDGs. And therefore I think it's really, really important that we now look at the new development framework in a broader way so that we can incorporate also the contributions of forestry to all the, the fields that, that Lou mentioned to, uh, to uh, eliminate poverty, to food security, um, energy issues, water issues, prosperity and green economy. Um, it's across the board and, and uh, 
I think this comparison and, and uh, looking back at the MDGs as a not so perfect uh, arrangement for, for, for forest is, is important. Yeah. And I think, you know, as a research organization, being able to tell, you know, put in place research that looks at, you know, what policy process, what policies lead to positive outcomes, what policies, you know, lead to, 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 to failures to, to achieve those outcomes, what is it about policy processes that, that lead to, to successful outcomes of the policy process, um, what measures on the ground actually achieve uh, progress, what are the benchmarks, what are the baselines, and what sort of progress can be achieved. And how can we, we recognize and manage these trade-offs? They're going to be emerging issues as, as, as uh, consumption patterns change, as, as population grows, as, population, as where populations and households live and earn their livings and how they organize their, their livelihoods. As that changes, it's going to be huge issues that, that, that come up that the society is going to need to face. And, and a research organization like C4 is there to begin to help put in place the evidence so that people can make, the policymakers can make informed decisions, that land managers can make informed decisions and, and be more sure of the outcome of, of what they're trying to, to put, the, the, the policies and measures they're putting in place to achieving their objectives. Thank you very much to you both for the stimulating conversation.